of Regional Development and currently Senior Fellow of Delhi Policy Group. Professor Mishra, Professor Radhakrishna, Professor Hashim, Professor Gupta, Dr. Jayashri Ravindran, colleagues and friends. It's honor and privilege for me to associate myself with this national conference. I think anyone who stands in between the inauguration of this national conference and the Tarlok Singh Memorial Lecture and takes more than the legitimate time would be causing loss of academic value added to this conference because any reduction in the time of Professor Radhakrishna's presentation would be resented by one and all including myself. And I think the conference themes have been structured so well by the organizing committee that it almost makes introduction of the conference theme redundant. But still, let me uh, try to give you a storyline connecting the five important sub-themes that have been included for discussion. First, trends and regional pattern of urbanization. I think it's an extremely important issue in the context of the whatever remains of the 12th five-year plan, and also it is recognized by Niti Ayog. Uh, World Bank and the ADB have talked about urban avalanche coming and hitting India. The document of IMF mentions that the epicenter of urbanization is shifting from Latin America to Asia, India, and China being the major uh, no, targets. So much so that ADB, when it makes a projection within a general equilibrium framework of a growth rate of 6 to 7% for India, it says that urbanization rate would be accelerating. On the one hand, this perspective exists, whereas the 12 five-year plan document says rate of urban growth is very low. Population census shows that the rate of growth of urban population has been going down from 4% to 3%, and now it is 2.7% during the last census, despite census activism. I want to have to really work out some kind of a balance between these two height, you know, the diametrical opposite perspectives, and also the pattern of urbanization. If you look at the data up to 1981, you do find that not only the percentage of urban population is strongly correlated is with the uh, per capita state domestic product. But if you look at the growth rate of urban population, it shows a negative relationship. But from 1981 onwards, you find the pattern is somewhat changing you find that the relatively developed states are showing somewhat higher growth rate of popul urban population and an acceleration in urban population. So much so that Registrar General of India says that EAG states, you know, empowered action group states, which means basically the less developed states are urbanizing at a slower pace. I think this is an imp extremely important issue which needs to be analyzed. I'm sure that this conference would address this. The second issue is about environment and sustainable development, the issues which are being debated in Paris. And I must say that the official position of government of India is being, in a way, questioned by even some of the delegates coming from India internally and also the internationally. They say that, look, this argument that Indian per capita emission is very low and we are not responsible for the greenhouse gases, it's the developed countries who should take the responsibility. This is not being acceptable within the given politically hostile global, global situation. The developed countries say all along that, well, our, we are not responsible for our forefathers' you know, guilt and also climate change was an issue which has come up recently. So I think the issue of sustainable urbanization is very critical in that because per capita emission in the large cities are much larger. And if you look at the uh, McKinsey Global Institute's projection, they say 65 million plus cities to come up. Delhi Mumbai corridor will have 24 big urban agglomerations. The high powered expert committee talks about 87 million plus cities by 2030. I think the issue 
of sustainability of urbanization and some kind of a resilience to be built in in the development structure by reorganizing the lifestyle and also reorganizing urban structure would be an important issue which comes as the second theme. The third is governance. From the 80s onwards, if you look at the literature, the researchers and also the uh, urban development organizations have been talking about the governance issue, deficit of infrastructure in the large cities, large cities not having enough economic resources, freedom to mobilize the uh, resources on their own, and we find massive thrust in the large cities. JNNURM took up 65 big cities. Ray also focused on the large cities. Smart cities, again, talk about 98 or 100 big cities. Now, smart cities is a concept which I was discussing with Professor Hashim when we are working out this structure. It's something which is very, very difficult to criticize. Because if you say, look, smart cities would only talk about high-tech facilities for the better off sections, poor will be marginalized, mar migrants, their needs would not be addressed, participatory governance, environmental issues would not be addressed. You talk about that. Immediately you find a joint secretary pulling up a document saying, hey, who says that? Here is the document. So there are all kinds of documents available which says that everything which is good is included in the smart cities, which really means that smart cities has become an ideal. It has not really become a tool of intervention. Unless you say smart cities would do A, B, C, and not X, Y, Z, it doesn't become an operational tool. And that's why this has been in included as an important uh, you know, item. And I hope Alakshandra brings in from University of Florida some kind of an outsider's perspective to talk about it. And I'm sure this is a uh, subject which is of great importance. The, uh, I'll just quickly go over the three other points. I hope I'm not exceeding the time. You see, the best definition of smart cities I've heard from Mr. Narendra Modi when he launched this smart cities project on 24th of June 2015. If you re remember, he did not mention a foreign investment coming in a big way, high-tech solutions, didn't talk about Bloomberg Foundation. He said smart cities are those cities which can anticipate the needs of the people. And the needs of the people, if you look at the NSS data, drinking water, sanitation facilities, they have, there is a decline over the past five years. And he said the city should be able to anticipate those needs and address them. I mean, he certainly talked about really the needs of the poorer sections of the population. And I personally believe that basic services, housing for all by 2022, is an issue. Land acquisition, you know, we are only talking about the compensation for the 3% of the people. What about the 97% of the people who would not benefit from compensation? What does the land do to them? These are the issues which come up importantly in the uh, fourth session. And finally, the issue of migration and slum development. I do not really don't want to go into the detailed data sets. I'm sure Professor Ravi Srivastava, Professor Alak Nand Sharma would talk about it. But I just want to mention one very important discussion that I had with Professor Hashim on this issue. We're talking about what would be the future of settlement pattern in India by 2050. Just very rough calculations. We have a population of 1,220 million. 2011 census. This would become something like 1,600 million by 2050. That's taking into consideration that our population growth will go down. So increase of 380 million people. But if you look at the workforce, it's about 480 million, it will become 900 million people in that relevant age group, which means your number of workers will increase by 420 million, more than the population increase because of the demographic dividend factor. Are we prepared structurally to provide employment to that section of the population? Are we thinking of an urbanization pattern which can really absorb them? Your large cities are becoming exclusionary in any case because they are trying to attract global capital and trying to retain the upper class and the middle class. 
What kind of settlement structure do we need? Do we need people to migrate to the larger cities or to their degenerated peripheries? Do we need to create small and medium towns? To what extent it is possible to absorb the rural people through Rurban Mission, Shama Prashad Rup Mukherjee Mission, which is talking about cluster development? I think this is an extremely important issue. As far as the slums are concerned, I would like to tell you that UN Habitat has complemented India. Your slum population has gone down 24% to 18%. That's the 2011 census data. You know, Pranab Sen Committee had said 93 million will be the slum dwelling population by 2011. It has only become 65 million. Now, is this a big achievement? Is slums we are providing the opportunity of inclusiveness. Are we improving the slum conditions to really reduce the hardships, or are we making our cities exclusionary? That's an issue of migration, settlement structure, and slums, which is taken up in the last session. I'm really very excited about these five sub-themes which have been put forward by the organizing committee, and I'm sure all of you will find the discussions to be very, very challenging, and it will contribute you know, significantly to the ongoing policy debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request Professor Surendra K. Gupta to introduce Professor R. Radhakrishnan. See, Professor Radhakrishnan doesn't need introduction to this audience. But even then, let me finish the formalities. Professor Radhakrishnan, currently chairman, Center for Economic and Social Studies, Hyderabad, began his teaching career in 1969-70 as lecturer in econometrics, Marathabad University, Aurangabad. Before this, he was senior research fellow at Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, Pune. In his long distinguished career, Professor Radhakrishnan served in various prestigious institutions such as Sardar Patel Institute of Economic and Social Research, Ahmedabad, University of Hyderabad, Member Secretary ISSSR, and also Vice Chancellor of Andhra University from 1998-2001. He worked as Director, Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, a deemed university established by the Reserve Bank of India. In 1986, he was awarded VKRV Rao Prize for significant contribution to the field of economics. He also received Telugu Atma Gaurav Puraskaranam in 1988 from the government of Andhra Pradesh for his eminence in social science research. He has occupied many positions and remained members of various national and international organizations and worked as members in various committees. The, the professor, before, besides authors of many monographs and books, he has also published more than 60 articles in national and international journals. Today, he will be delivering 10th Thurloxi Memorial Lecture. The topic of today's lecture is, what do we learn about India from happiness and well-being indicators? And let me also tell you, the first six lectures of this memorial lecture series have already been published in a book form titled Rethinking, Planning and Development uh, that was edited by Yogi Shatal and published in 2013. Now I request Professor Radhakrishna to deliver the 10th Tarloksi Memorial Lecture. Professor Radhakrishna. Professor Hashim, Professor R.K. Mesra, Professor Amitabh Kundu, Dr. Jayasri Ravindra, Professor Yogesh Atal, and uh, distinguished uh, delegates. I'm extremely grateful to the chairman, Professor Asar Hashim, and member secretary Sri S.K. Gupta of the Indian Association of Social Science Institutions for inviting me to deliver the 10th Talok Singh Memorial Lecture. I had the good fortune of being acquainted with uh, Sri Talok Singh. He was a great visionary, socialist thinker, and a keen observer of social change in India. His contributions to planning in India soon after independence was remarkable. Above all, he was a humanist dedicated to the life to bring social change in India. I am very glad to have the opportunity of delivering the lecture dedicated to his memory. Of late, several international agencies are constructing composite indicators for assessing progress of a country as well as their 
inter-country comparisons, cross-national happiness index, subjective well-being measure of world happiness report, and social progress index are currently popular well-being indicators. My lecture, memorial lecture, provides a brief overview of the well-being indices, discusses the subjectivity involved in these methods, and provides ranking of selected countries on well-being indices. It assesses India's position among countries on well-being ranking. It comprehensively analyzes India's progress on well-being in the post-reform period by utilizing real per capita monthly ex consumer expenditure and Atkinson's welfare function. It particularly assesses whether the growth is pro-poor. The paper also provides the ranking of states on current levels of multiple deprivations, as well as the ranking on the reduction of multiple deprivations in the post-reform period. Among the indicators of well-being, real per capita income and real per capita expenditure, consumer expenditure are, are most popular measures. St substantial scientific efforts have been made to develop national accounts framework and its data sources. However, there is a growing realization that the link between GDP and well-being is complex and a, a host of factors intervene between them. It is argued that while an increase in the, in the per capita GDP improves well-being in, in less developed countries, until basic needs are met, it may not improve much well-being in the developed countries because affluence is associated with its scientific efforts are, are being made to extend the national income accounts framework by incorporating income distribution, gender and environmental concerns. However, these extensions are still in their nascent stage. In the per capita consumer expenditure approach, the consumption basket of an individual is valued at base year prices and real per capita expenditure is arrived by aggregating real expenditure on commodities of all individuals within a group. The, re the change in real per capita expenditure of the group is thus considered as a measure of welfare change. However, this procedure ignores distributional issues. The restrictive arg argument is unappealing. It has prompted the use of social welfare function, which is based on normative judgments in the measurement of well-being. Amartya Sen, distribution inclusive measure of real income, also overcomes these limitations. The measurement of poverty largely dealt with economic deprivation in the income and expenditure space. Poverty estimates have been extensively used in assessing macro policies for inclusive growth as well as designing public intervention programs to target the poor and supplement generic growth strategy. These initiatives inspired a large number of methodological stu studies on measurement and identification of uh, poor. Professor Ashim also has made substantial contribution in this area. However, by now, there is a growing recognition that poverty is not a matter of simply inadequate income, but also low literacy, lack of basic needs, short life expectation, uncertainty, not enjoying political freedom, and so on. When income rises from very low levels, although human well-being improves in some dimensions, it may not ensure fulfillment of other dimensions of human well-being that depends on public goods and political freedom. Considering GDP and income poverty are commodity-centric, human development and multi Dimensional poverty measures have been popularized by the UNDP as people-centric measure and last two decades observed solid methodological developments in to measure human development and multidimensional uh, poverty. UNDP is making periodic inter-country comparisons in human development and some national and official agencies are engaged in the sub 
regional comparisons. These developments have enriched our understanding of national well-being. Over the last decade, some efforts have been made to develop a, a framework for measuring subjective well-being, for evaluating policies and programs to guide development. Bhutan, UK, OECD countries attempted to develop happiness index. This, has, this had prompted several studies on the measurement of happiness, its causes as well as its beneficial consequences. The Center for Botanist Studies pub publishes publications how botanist philosophy and underpins the Gross National Happiness Index. I may sell, uh, tell you that Bhutan is the country among among the world which prompted uh, prompted studies on happiness index, and uh, that and later on London School of Economics and uh, some universities in Canada and Harvard have started and uh, work on happiness uh, indices. According to official estimates, gross national happiness measures uh, the quality of a country in a more holistic manner and believes that the beneficial development of human society takes place when material and spiritual developments occur side by side uh, to complement and reinforce each other. The true abiding happiness cannot exist when others suffer and comes only from serving others, living in harmony with nature and realizing our innate wisdom and brilliant nature of our minds. The Gross National Happiness Index evolved since mid-60s has nine component dimensions – living standards, health, education, time use, cultural diversity and resilience, good governance, psychological well-being, and community vitality, and ecological diversity. The well-being dimensions covered beyond those covered by human development index. It is in some way an extension of the human development index. In the construction of the index, 33 indic indicators representing the nine domains are used. A total of 124 variables have been used.